So thank you for showing up early in the morning to listen to this. Uh, in the spirit of this workshop, I thought I'll talk about some work in progress. Uh, so the tentative title of well, the title of my talk is Entanglement and Theories of Gravity, and uh, this is work which is very much in progress uh, with uh, Sudeep Ghosh, uh, Ronak Soni, M. V. Vishal, and Sandeep Trivedi. Uh, Ronak and Vishal are students of uh, Sandeep at uh, TIFR, and uh, Sudeep, as all of you know, is a student here. Um, so uh, let me just start by uh, trying to outline the motivation for this talk and what the problem is. Okay, so what, what is the problem in defining entanglement in theories of gravity? So of course, uh, we all know that you know, if you have a nice uh, direct product splitting of the Hilbert space, so you have some big Hilbert space, and you, know, you can write it in this way. Uh, then there are various measures of entanglement that you can define. You can have states which are entangled, uh, between, uh, you know, which are states in the big Hilbert space that can't be written as a product of a state here and a product of a state here. And of course, uh, you know, we know that, for example, you know, you might have some state which is even a pure state in this space H, and then, uh, but you know, that doesn't look like a pure state if you look only at the set of operators that act within H1, or you look only at the Hilbert space of H1, and all of us know that, you know, you can define this density matrix. And once you've defined this density matrix, you can define various measures of entanglement. Uh, one very commonly used measure of entanglement is just the von Neumann entropy. Okay. okay. So now, already in quantum field theories, uh, we start having a slight problem uh, because there isn't this neat direct product splitting of the Hilbert space. If I give you some big quantum, some big region, and I divide it into two regions, R1 and R2. Already, uh, you know, uh, how you split the degrees of freedom, how you write the full space as a product space involves various subtleties. And uh, this is the fact, you know, this is related to the statement that the entanglement entropy that you define, if you try to think this Hilbert space of this full quantum field theory as a direct product of a space here and a space here, the entanglement entropy that you define would depend on your UV cutoff. Okay, so already, uh, you'll have short distance degrees of freedom uh, that will entangle these two sides, and you need to be careful about how to regulate these degrees of freedom. Okay, so already, uh, in quantum field theory, there are some subtleties, but these are subtleties that we think we understand uh, how to deal with. And of course, one way uh, to deal with these subtleties uh, is to go to um, quantities that don't have these uh, sensitivities to the UV cutoff, uh, such as the relative entropy or the mutual information. Okay, but now uh, I'm going to try and persuade you that in gravity, the situation is, is far more subtle, and let me start by explaining why that's the case. You know, the first thing you recognize when you start thinking of, of this kind of direct product splitting of the hill is, is that it relies very sharply on a notion of being able to localize degrees of freedom. You see, unless you have some full degrees of freedom, and you want to say some of these degrees of freedom belong to this region, and some others belong to this region. But uh, there's a very well-known statement in gravity which says that there do not exist any local gauge invariant operators in gravity. Okay. okay. So some of you may have heard this statement, but for those of you who haven't, uh, let me just try and try and motivate this in, in various ways. Uh, the simplest way to understand this statement is to recognize that uh, the charge in gravity is the mass or the energy. So therefore, for something to be gauge invariant, it has to have zero energy. And the only way it can have zero energy is by basically giving it infinite extent in space. If you try to confine uh, some operator to a local region in space, uh, then that necessarily, just by the uncertainty principle, uh, gives it some energy. And the moment it has energy, it can't be gauge invariant. Okay? Uh, so this is something you can, you can prove more formally. Uh, in fact, um, and uh, so it's, it's not too hard to see even at a formal level, uh, what I just said at an intuitive level. But it's a fact that there are no local gauge invariant operators in gravity. Now sometimes, uh, you know, it's possible to define, well, uh, it's also true that in our experience, uh, we live in a world which has gravity, and we do also experience approximate locality. So it's certainly true that for some purposes, it's, it's possible to define approximately local gauge invariant operators. And the way this is done is as follows. Okay. So um, let me give you an example of how this is done in EDS-CFT. Uh, you think of, of, of anti de Sitter space, and uh, you fix some point on the boundary. Okay, so some point on the boundary is given by some time uh, and some position on the sphere on the boundary. 
And then uh, you think of an observer who jumps in from this point in the boundary on a geodesic. Uh, you can specify the angle of the geodesic. And he waits for some time tau. And after this time tau, he reaches some point P. And then you can ask, you know, what is the value of some field at this point P that is reached by jumping in from the boundary at this, at this reference point and waiting time tau. Okay? Now, this gives you something that's only approximately gauge invariant because you see that this whole process involves what's called a framing to the boundary. Okay? You have to frame this operator to the boundary. And therefore, this operator is not really a local operator. One way to think of this, and the analog in, in electrodynamics, is to think of an operator having a Wilson line that goes off all the way to the boundary. So this idea of framing operators by means of geodesics uh, is an idea of, you know, is, is to the procedure of having Wilson lines uh, that, that frame, you know, a charged field in electrodynamics uh, to something on the boundary. So this, you, should, you can think of this geodesic procedure as having a Wilson line that goes from here to here. So that gives you an operator that for many purposes does behave like a local operator. If you try to define field operators like this, uh, then these field operators would behave like local operators. For example, you know, you would find that if you looked at this correlation function in four dimensions, uh, you took some more points, then this correlation function to leading order, for example, would indeed behave like, like this. It would also factorize, okay? And then there would be other corrections that would be suppressed in the ads 50 example by order one by n. But to leading order, this operator will factorize, and therefore to many, for many purposes, uh, these definitions give you, a, you know, these definitions of this kind give you some sense in which you have local operators. So you might imagine that you might be able to use a definition of this kind uh, to define uh, what you mean by the degrees of freedom that are localized uh, to one point in space, at least in examples where uh, you have a, f a boundary uh, like you have in anti deciduous space. Yeah. Uh, you don't require gravity to be? You could, you could talk about quantum computing and fixed background. Mm -hmm. You still have these uh, thoughts. Why, 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 why do you say that? If you had. Where did you, where did you assume that the gravity has to be? Sorry, uh, so, so the issue of, well, okay, so, so the, the, the uh, uh, well, the, the problem arose in the first place because you want things to be gauge invariant and under diffeomorphism. Uh, and, and the fact that, that this framing matters uh, is because if you had metric fluctuations, an operator that was framed to this point would be different from an operator that was framed to this point. You see, I could have said, let, let me frame an operator uh, starting from some point T prime omega prime and follow for a distance tau prime. Okay, uh, fixed background is these operators might coincide, uh, but uh, you know uh, the fact that the operator depends on the framing uh, is because the operator is, is because you're living in a in a world which has dynamical gravity, and so two two operators which might, for example, coincide in empty ADS uh, will not coincide in some operator which has uh, which has uh, uh, you know. Uh, which has fluctuations about ADS. So if you're living in a fixed background, you would be able to define some coordinate system once and for all, and everyone else would be able to define some coordinate system, and you'd be able to give them a map once and for all, and there would be no subtlety, you know, there would be no uh, meaningful dependence on how you frame things. Uh, but the moment you have typical gravity, there's a meaningful dependence on how you frame things. Uh, but the fact that uh, the, uh, the fluctuations would actually uh, require a dynamical gravity, so is there some uh, mathematically defined sense of the problem? This is a mathematically approximate sense. See, if you define the, the this is if you define these operators uh, in this way, uh, you could you could you know you can define these operators by trying to define them by putting some delta function in the path integral, for example. The claim is that these operators have some leading uh, functions. Uh, this leading part is universal. Okay, it doesn't depend on whether you framed it this way or this way. But then there's some one over n terms that depend on how you fix the gauge. So, so that's the mathematical sense in which you have approximate locality, in that the operators that you get here are approximately local. You know, or you could commute, you could compute commutators between these operators, and these commutators would be suppressed by one over n. And so that's the sense in which you have approximate locality, but you don't have exact locality. Also, like when n is going infinity, in flat space, we don't have a larger gauge. Oh, so good. So in flat space, the the parameter that's important is is the well, is the energy of the operator divided by m plank. So 
uh, you need to speak of operators which are slightly smeared out, and then you can associate some energy to these operators. And then, uh, the, you, in fact, given a configuration of operators, you can associate an energy to that configuration of operators. And the sense in which the commutator between two things is suppressed is uh, by that energy of that configuration divided by implying to the power d minus 2 d dimensions. Okay. So now you might have thought that, you know, in a sense that you have approximate locality, uh, you would have, uh, you know, you would be able to use this to define entanglement entropy in that I would talk about the degrees of freedom that were approximately localized in this and the degrees of freedom that are approximately localized in this side and then you give me a state of the theory and I'll be able to define entanglement entropy and you might have thought that the corrections that you would get from this locality would be some 1 over n corrections, right? So you might have thought that the entanglement entropy is also basically unambiguously defined up to some 1 over n uh, gauge dependent terms, okay? So now I'm going to try and persuade you that in fact this problem is, is much more serious um, and uh, it, it occurs and I'll, I'm going to give you an example of how, of how this problem arises, okay? So, yes. Um, uh, completely different from the problem in gauge theory of ten uh -huh. tensor product, uh, you know, they're not being yeah. a tensor product. Uh, so they're, they're, they're different in a, uh, so I'll, let, let me, give, give me some time and I'll try and describe. So it's true that even in gauge theory there's an, there's an ambiguous piece which depends on, you know, how you choose the center of the algebra. Um, I, I'm going to try and tell you how these problems are more serious in, in gravity. Uh, so, Gautam is pointing out that, you know, even in gauge theories, uh, because for charge fields you have these Wilson lines that, uh, that stretch out, uh, there are some operators, you know, uh, you have this difficulty of writing down this direct product Hilbert space, and as Sudeep and Ronak and Sandeep and others have been working out in great detail, uh, you know, this ambiguity has to do with how you define the center of the algebra. But at least in some situations, like if you look at the mutual information of the relative entropy, uh, these ambiguities uh, go away. Uh, but I'm going to point out that in gravity, these ambiguities will remain even in this situation. Okay, so I'm doing very badly on time, but but let me. Okay, so l let me start by giving you the following example. Okay, so here, here's ADS. Okay, but now uh, uh, this is a cross section at at constant time. Okay, so this is a constant time cross section. Okay, and here's my region R. Okay, so I want to define now the entanglement entropy of this region R. Okay, this is. Okay, so is the picture clear? I have constant time cross section. It's some, some cross section here. Okay, and I've taken this cross section and I've drawn it here. And so I have some region which, which, is, which is some annular region. It excludes some hole in the middle of ADS, uh, but it, has, it includes the boundary and it's this region R. Okay? So now you might have thought that this region R has some, has some entanglement entropy. Right? This region R has some entanglement entropy because this region is entangled with this complementary region that I left out. The shaded region is entangled with the region I left out. But notice that R includes a complete Cauchy slice on the boundary. Because this slice on the boundary, which is part of the region R, is a complete Cauchy slice. It's, it's the Cauchy slice that runs around the cylinder here. Therefore, in fact, R has information about everything that's happening in the boundary theory. So therefore, even though you might have expected that there's a non-zero entanglement between R and this hole, uh, you know, it appears that the entanglement entropy is zero of R. Okay. Uh, do you see, do you see why, why that's the case? You know, the, the argument is very simple. It's the fact that R includes as part of it the boundary. Okay, okay let, let me give you, let me give you another, another, let me give you another way of looking at it. You see, you could, you could think of two different states on R, okay? Uh, so that one state had a bump here. And one state, you know, didn't have anything. One state was just flat here. And you could ask about the relative entropy of these states when they are reduced to states on R. Okay. You might have thought that that relative entropy is zero because these states coincide on R. However, these are different states in the full boundary theory. And therefore, just by looking at operators on the boundary, by looking at sufficiently complicated operators on the boundary, you can distinguish this white state from this red state. Okay. Therefore, the relative entropy is not zero. Okay. That's an example of what I was saying here. So it looks like, like, like you know, you have, you have you know, at least whatever you're thinking of as, as notions of entanglement is in rather serious conflict with your notions of locality. Okay. Let me give you another example. This was an example when you, you would have thought you'd get a finite answer, but you got zero. I can give you another example where 
thought you'd get one finite answer, but in fact, it looks like the answer is another one. Uh, let's take some reason. Uh, let's again take a cross section. Uh, and now let's take some region like this. So this is part of the boundary. Uh, and I'll take the following region. Okay. So let me take R to be this region. Okay, so R is the shaded region. And I, once again, I might have thought that R has a large entanglement with the rest of the boundary. In fact, I might have thought maybe I can compute the entanglement entropy of R as the area of this boundary divided by 4G Newton in a theory of gravity. But you see that, in fact, R includes part of the boundary, which is RB. Okay? And we know what the entanglement entropy of RB is. Right? The entanglement entropy of RB is given by the Ryu Takenagi formula. The Ryu Takenagi formula instructs us to find you know, the Ryu Takenagi surface that's dual to RB. And the surface does this. It goes out much beyond R. Okay, it gives, it's geodesic that goes from this point to this point. And therefore, the, you know, the entropy of R that you would have thought, you might have thought that the entanglement entropy was, of R was a of R by 4G Newton, naively, okay? But uh, here's another answer that seems to be suggesting that it's in fact the area of the Ryu Takenagi surface of the boundary. So let me call that CB, okay? I'll call this CB, which is a totally different surface, okay? So once again, you know, you thought that you had confined operators to this region, but in fact, the entanglement you're getting is an entanglement for a much larger region. Okay? So this is, a, this is a very significant problem. It tells us that even to leading order, uh, we have a problem in defining entanglement in theories of gravity. The what? Yes. It's the same thing. So I, I, I took, so, so I, I, R is a solid area. By A of R, I meant, I meant the area of the boundary of R. Sorry, by A of R, I meant the area of the boundary of R. I should write A of, uh, uh, there are two boundaries. There's the part of the boundary that coincides with this, which I call RB. And then by A of R, I, I meant this area plus, I meant this area, okay. It, no, no, both these answers are, uh, you, could, you could regularize both these answers. I mean, there's some divergence that comes. But you could regularize both these answers. And it looks like you'd get you know, two answers. Uh, it's, I mean, this is the standard Ryu Takenagi prescription. Okay, so, 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 this is, so I, I just hope, I hope that the puzzle at least is clear to everyone. I've taken up a lot, a lot of my time, but, but, but uh, I hope the puzzle is clear to everyone. And once again, by the way, we'd have the same problem with relative entropy. So, so maybe, maybe this is a better way to say it. You see, we could think of relative entropy of two states that differ on this but coincide on R, but they differ within this, within this entanglement wedge. And we see that the relative entropy would be non-zero uh, if you, you know, when you took into account this full entanglement wedge, it would be zero in this case. That would be a case where you, you wouldn't have this problem of infinity, because this relative entropy would be some finite quantity. So you could think of states, one state which has a bump here, and another state that has no bump here, and you could, you could ask, is the relative entropy between these two states zero or not? If you thought that you were localizing your degrees of freedom to R, you'd say the relative entropy is zero, but clearly it can't be zero because, you know, LMS told us, uh, Jaffris, uh, Lukovic, Maldesena, and Sue, told us that the relative entropy of this causal wedge was the same as the relative entropy of this region, and therefore it looks like the answer can't be zero. Okay, okay so there's a puzzle, uh, and so let me try and describe um, uh, what, what we can do about this puzzle. Yes? The C, yes. This, yes, yes. Why is it that the information about those two states uh, is not sort of, you know, imprinted on that surface? On, so you might have thought of some, some region. It's to be, you know. Well, uh, well, so you, you, you might have, in, in a local quantum field theory, it doesn't have to be. If you had a local quantum field theory, then you could have thought of states which differed in this, in this inside disk and were completely identical here. That has to be the case, right? You can, think of, you can think of states which differ here and which are completely identical here. In a theory of gravity, it's true you can't because you can tell all information here from the boundary because gravity is holographic. I beg your pardon? The boundary. Yes, but even given both of these boundaries, yes. in a local quantum field theory, yes. the entropy of R, uh, you know, the relative entropy of R in these two states would be zero. You could think of states that, that have, you know, that have some excitation that's entirely localized here, and so that correlation functions here are entirely unchanged. In a local, I mean, that's almost the essence of locality. No gauge theory is really a local quantum field theory. Well, 
This theory is really a local quantum field theory, but you know, you can even in a gauge theory, you could think of a gauge invariant excitation, which was made by a gauge invariant local operator. You see, even though, even though gauge theories are not local theories, uh, you can think of uh, just a trace of f squared, which is a gauge invariant local operator. So even in a gauge theory, you can have two states which differ here and are completely identical here, whereas, which you can't do in a theory of gravity. There's something more, see, you see the, the difference between a theory of gravity and an ordinary gauge theory is that in a theory of gravity, there are no local gauge invariant operators. There's a problem with that principle. With this principle? Yeah, I mean, the point is that if you want to do any measurement in theory of gravity, you can't just be this. No, the Gauss, well, sorry, I didn't understand. The, the, what is the, the statement is that they don't exist. That they don't exist any local gauge invariant operators. There, are, there is no existence of any local gauge invariant operators. No, but it is, it, this is an example of how it's relevant in that, you know, because you don't have local gauge invariant operators, you can't think of excitations that, that differ here and that don't differ in this part. I may not, uh, is, what's, okay, sure, I can, I can explain to you in more detail later, okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> Fine. We, we can also t t talk now more if you like, but sure. Okay. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, so, so let me try and let me try and uh, try try and mention why. Well, okay. So, so the first step to resolving this uh, comes from comes from recognizing, you know, what you would have to do if you wanted to measure this excitation here from the boundary. Okay. Uh, so this is something we worked in some detail uh, in work with uh, with Kiriakos, uh, uh, Shovik Banerjee, and Jan William Bryan. And it turns out that if you wanted to distinguish these two states by measuring some operator here, it is indeed true that in a theory of gravity, you can write down all operators, including an operator in the middle of ADS, let me call this phi zero, in terms of operators that live in the boundary. But there's something funny about this map. And the thing that's funny about this map is that phi zero is a very complicated polynomial. It's a polynomial of order n in operators that live in the boundary. or that on terms of operators at limit. Okay. So it is indeed true that operators in the middle of ADS can be written in terms of operators that live in the boundary. It's also true that just by means of correlation functions, you can differentiate between this state and this state just by making measurements here. But the kinds of measurements you have to make are measurements of very complicated operators. Okay. So this one, this polynomial requires this R right now is this whole shaded region. Uh, to write down this polynomial, you'll need uh, information about R on everywhere in the boundary. You could write down something similar for here, in which case you'd be able to take information on part of the boundary and reconstruct this much, all the way up to CB, all the entanglement. Yes? Uh, not really. What we really need is, uh, in a, well, what we really need is just canonical gravity and the Gauss's law. You know, within, I, in a sense, uh, uh, David could have could have figured out this formula if he thought about it. Much. Uh, it's you know the reason we need ADS is because we need to put some infrared cutoff. So being in ADS is a good thing, but we don't need too much of the mechanism of ADS CFT. We don't need any of the details of the conformal theory. We do need the fact that there's some ultraviolet complete theory, because and there's yes. Uh, Cauchy's reference of the boundary. Yes. Uh, why is that important? It's not, not, not in the theory of gravity because the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. Uh, I, can try and, I can try and write down this formula in more detail for you a little. But the fact that the Hamiltonian is a boundary term is just a statement in canonical gravity. So in, you know, in principle, uh, David could have, could have figured this out. Because the Hamiltonian is a boundary term, you can take all these operators and you can evolve them arbitrarily in time if time runs this way. And then you'll get operators that are in causal contact with this. You know, because these operators have light rays that come out this way. And so you, because the Hamiltonian is a boundary term, you could you can you can do this even in in canonical gravity. Such a thing would happen also in Jern Simmons' gauge theory. No? Such a thing would happen also in in, in Jern Simmons gauge theory. Um, um, maybe uh, I'll have to think more, but maybe uh, if you had uh, maybe. But, but there also you would anyway have this problem of not having uh, uh, local degrees of freedom. But yes, maybe. Okay. 
Yeah, that, that may be a simple case to simple. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I, I haven't uh, reached very far, but uh, okay. Let, let, let me try and, try and go through fast. So, so, so the, the, the main point is that that operators in the middle of ADS uh, can be represented as very complicated operators in the boundary. And so, really, if you want to define entanglement, I want to say that in a sense, both these answers. The answer that it's zero and the answer that it, it there is some genuine entanglement. And the fact that there's this, this answer is non-zero and represents the entanglement of R with the rest of the region. And the fact that it represents the entanglement of the, the causal wedge with the rest of the region uh, is, I think both these answers I want to say are correct. But they are correct when, you, when you're careful about what kinds of degrees of freedom you include in gravity. So I want to say that there are two, two notions of entanglement you can define. Uh, one notion of entanglement is what one might call coarse entanglement. And I'll try and make this precise in a second. And then there's a notion of entanglement that one might call fine entanglement. Okay, and I'll make both of these precise in a second. And depending on which notion you use, I'm going to say that uh, you will get both, both the answers uh, that, that, that I described there. Okay, uh, so let me just try and describe the setup, and then I'll de describe what these two notions of entanglement are. So the setup is as follows, okay? Uh, it's very important that you, in, in a theory of gravity, that if you want a notion of locality, and because you can have complicated polynomial relations between different local operators that are space-like separated, uh, it's very important that you restrict from the start what the set of simple operators in the theory are, okay? So physically, this corresponds to a statement that you have some observer who jumps in, uh, from ADS, and if you want this operator, if you want this observer to, you know, to observe approximate locality, then you want to restrict the possible measurements this observer can make to simple measurements. Uh, this is something that's also appeared, for example, in this quantum error correction literature, uh, where people point out that you want to restrict the possible measurements that this observer can make uh, to measurements within the core subspace. Okay, so the setup, more precisely, is a statement that there's some state psi. Okay, this is a state psi in H, in this full Hilbert space. And then the observer, the little observer that you have, can act with some operators on the state psi. Okay, this i goes from one to d. And this doesn't include the set of all operators in the theory. Okay, so you allow the observer to measure, to make some set of measurements, uh, which will correspond to the set of simple measurements. I'll describe in a second what I want those set of measurements to be. Uh, but I allow the observer to act with some set of simple operators in the state psi, but not with all operators in the theory. Okay? So this is my restriction of an observer to an observer with finite bars. Okay? So the setup is, first I allow the observer to measure these expectation values, but then I allow the observer to do a little bit more. I allow the observer to work more generally in a little Hilbert space, which is a span of these operators. Okay? So this little Hilbert space is some subset of the full Hilbert space. It's not necessarily a tensor factor. Okay? It's a subset of the full Hilbert space. And this involves the span of all operators I can create by acting with these operators A on my initial state psi. Okay? Now I'll also allow the observer to measure inner products of this little Hilbert space. And uh, it's not hard to justify physically why uh, that's also not so hard to do. So I'll allow my observer to measure this, and allow my observer to measure this. Okay. So I'll allow my observer to measure these kinds of inner products. And that's actually clear, because once the observer can make cause transitions from the state psi to this AI psi, it's very easy for the observer also to measure these kinds of inner products. But notice I'm not going to allow the observer to measure arbitrary products of these operators. Okay. And so there's a big difference between this and the usual setup. And that is that if E1 is a simple operator, E2 is a simple operator, then E1 into E2 may not be a simple operator. Okay. So this notion of entanglement that I want to define is a notion of entanglement on sets of operators which are not algebras. Crucially distinguishes it uh, from the direct product factorization of the Hilbert space I had previously, because a set of operators that act on one subfactor of the Hilbert space always form an algebra. They're closed under multiplication. Whereas a set of simple operators is 
almost by definition not closed under multiplication. Because you know, if you just give me simple field operators and then you allow me to multiply them arbitrarily, then I can generate whatever operator I like. Okay? So therefore the set of set of simple operators is not closed under multiplication. And so the mathematical problem we have in defining entanglement in the theory of gravity is to define entanglement for sets which are not algebras. Okay? Okay. Now let me try and try and tell you uh, <laughs> two, two, two minutes. <laughs> Time's over, and this also. Uh, few, few minutes more, and then, then, then I'll. Uh, <laughs> it's all that I can't even blame anyone, right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so let, let me let me try and try and go a little fast. So, um, I wish I could give you a little more motiv motivation, but let, let me just try and give you a definition of 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 how you can define entanglement for bits. So this definition adapts the definition by Nannhofer and Thuring. Okay. Uh, they weren't quite thinking of sets. Uh, they were in fact thinking of thinking of algebras, but we can adapt their definition uh, to get what we want. And it works as follows. And I'm happy to give you all more motivation uh, later. Uh, really running out of time. Uh, so first, I want to define uh, something called the relative modular operator which is a model operator from this h phi. So I have two states, omega and phi, and h phi is that, is that little Hilbert space I defined there, going to h phi. And this relative modular operator is defined as follows. Okay, so what it does is, if you give it uh, some AI dagger with AJ, it flips them. Okay, so it gives you the expectation value of the same two operators in omega, but after flipping the order. Okay, so, so this is what's called a relative modular operator. Um, it's, okay, I don't have time to motivate this too much, but let, let me just define, so this is the definition. This is another state in H omega, so I want to define now the relative entropy. I'm actually going to define for you the relative entropy for sets, and then we'll come to how you define the entanglement entropy. So I have two states, omega and phi, and between these two states, I'm going to define this relative modular operator, which takes you from some states in h psi, it's an operator from h psi to h psi, tells you the expectation values in h psi depend on expectation values in this omega. So I'm going to define for you, uh, right, so there, there are two states, omega and psi, and this is the relative modular operator. And then the claim is that the entangle, the relative entanglement entropy is this. Okay, so the relative entanglement entropy between omega and phi is the expectation value of log of this relative modular operator. Okay. Uh, it's not difficult to check uh, that in the situation where you have a direct product factorization of the Hilbert space, this definition of the relative entanglement entropy, of the relative entropy coincides with the usual definition of the relative entropy. Okay. It's not difficult to check that in the case where you do have the factorization that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this definition is the same as the usual definition. But uh, this definition is something that generalizes naturally to the setup we, we have, where I'm allowing you to measure only do measurements within this edge psi and only measure these kinds of inner products within edge psi. Okay. Okay. Now uh, we can also define. This operator is not defined in the point. So you are giving the matrix presence only inside edge psi. But that's, yes. So those are the only matrix elements. Uh, that, that's my rule everywhere. I only want to define operators within edge psi. You know, my little observer doesn't have access to any space that's beyond edge psi. In fact, I define the operator on the rest of the Hilbert space by defining it with a projector. So, you know, I, I'll basically define delta of uh, this omega phi on chi equal to zero if chi is orthogonal to h to h phi. So this is how I'll define it. So it, it it's in fact zero, and that's okay because my little observer doesn't have access to anything outside this little Hilbert space. So it basically annihilates everything else. And you can also define the modular operator. Uh, okay, so, so I'll, I'll be very, very quick. You can also define the modular operator, which is just phi phi. Okay. Uh, this modular operator is 
Define the same way. Phi e g dagger. In the usual case, uh, this modular operator phi, phi uh, corresponds to the following situation. In the case where you have a direct product factorization of the Hilbert space, this modular operator is this. It's the density matrix direct producted with the inverse of the density matrix on the complementary factor. Okay? So this is the density matrix direct producted with the inverse of the complementary, uh, with the density matrix on the uh, complementary factor. So you can think of this as e to the h minus h bar. So the modular operator is the operator that generates evolution with the modular Hamiltonian on the, the, the part, you know, on, on the direct product of the Hilbert space and the, you know, the complement of the modular Hamiltonian or minus of that on the other side. So it may be messed up the sign. Minus h plus h bar is the usual definition. Okay, uh, once again, I, I don't have time to explain why this result is true, but uh, it, it's true. And of course, in the case where you don't have a direct product factorization in the Hilbert space, this definition still works, because this is just a definition of an operator from H phi to H phi. Okay, so in, in the case where you have a direct product factorization, you have this. In the case where you don't, that definition is still good. In fact, uh, you might have thought that you would be able to use the modular operator to extract the entanglement entropy. Uh, but we, we haven't quite figured out how to do that yet. Uh, so I'm going to give you another definition of the entanglement entropy. And the entanglement entropy is defined as follows. The supremum is taken over all lambda is greater than zero, lambda i. There you go. And I equal to one. Okay. So the way you define the entangle, entanglement entropy of omega, of some state omega, is basically by trying to extremize its distance from some other states. From some, in fact, you can prove that these states have to be pure states for the algebra. Um, Okay, but uh, let, let me just give you this definition for now, and le le let, me say, let me say a few more things. I, I just want to point out that we have a definition of, of the entanglement entropy. This definition of the entanglement entropy, again, you can prove. In the usual direct product case, does give you the usual entanglement entropy. Uh, but uh, in, in this, this is a definition which works, works more generally in this situation where we only want to work within this little hill space. Okay, okay uh, le let me just say a few quick things, and then, then, I'll, then I'll end. Um, so, uh, ah, good. So, good, good, good. So, so this, so this, right. So, the relative entropy. In fact, we can prove many nice things. Thank you for asking that question. You can prove, for example, the positivity of the relative entropy. Uh, you can also prove the monotonicity of the relative entropy. Uh, for the entanglement entropy itself, we're able to prove less. In particular, one thing that we really need to prove is prove that strong subadditivity holds. which we have not been able to do yet. Okay, so this is to do. Uh, so as I said, this is work in progress. In fact, we don't even know that it holds in the case where you have a set. Uh, but, so let me put a question mark. Uh, so we don't, of course, in the case where you have a direct product factorization, it holds because you can map it to the usual definition. But in general, we don't know if it holds. Uh, for this relative entropy, we can prove the monotonicity of the relative entropy and the positivity. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, we, we need to understand this better. So this is something which, if some of you have some bright ideas or know how to prove this in this case, uh, please uh, uh, talk to me and uh, we'll be very glad. Okay, good. Uh, so so let, let, me, let me just say the following. Uh, uh, let, let, let me just conclude now uh, with, with, with some, some quick observations. So the set of simple operators I want to think of in the case of gravity are the following. I want to think of field operators and I want to think of the product of field operators, these quasi-local field operators that are defined by framing things to the boundary. And I want to think of products of up to k field operators. Okay, so this is my set of simple operators. But k now is a variable cutoff. Okay? So the conjecture is the let, let me make some, some conjectures. 
uh, which we haven't proved, but I, I think they should hold. The conjecture is, in the case where you take k to be much larger than 1 and k to be much smaller than n, okay, so you, you're thinking of simple operators, you allow many products of simple operators or field operators, but you're not allowing up to n products, then I claim that the entanglement entropies you get by using this kind of definition will coincide with the usual notions of what you wanted for local entanglement entropies. For example, I claim that, that if you did this, you looked at this region R and you looked at products of up to k operators in this region R, then you would indeed get the entanglement entropy of this annular region. But if you took the region where k goes to infinity, so you allowed infinite products, okay, so this is what I'll call the coarse entropy. And the conjecture is that this has all the properties of locality that you want. And in the limit where you take k goes to infinity, then you get what one might call the fine grain entropy. And that fine grain entropy is in fact obtained by taking this region on the boundary and by looking at the entanglement wedge of this region on the boundary. In this case, this entanglement wedge gives you the full Cauchy slice. Okay? So, actually, you, once you take k to be much larger than n, I think it doesn't matter. So my suspicion, you know, in general, you're allowed k goes to infinity, you're allowed infinite products. I think you're right that once you take k to be much larger than n, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, but I would just, you know, in, you can take the extreme limit which is k goes to infinity, but you're slight, right that the transition between these two probably occurs at some point. Goes to infinity. Really means single trace operators. Well, huh? Oh, yeah, you're uh, certainly allowed the, the derivatives of that. But I mean single trace operators. And in fact, to take derivatives, I would probably separate them. I would have to do some UV cutoff and look at differences. Uh, so these are conjectures. We need to make some of these things precise uh, to, to say what you're saying, okay? Okay, so as k goes to infinity, uh, you get the fine entropy. Okay, one, one, one last thing I want to say. Uh, le let me try and point out how, how these definitions are very important uh, if you wanted to understand how they resolve any confusions, for example, that occur in some versions of the information paradox. And, and then I'll, I'll conclude with that. Actually, let's, let's take this. So let me take this region R and let me just define some more regions. Let me call this region B, which is the green region. Okay, so this is the green region, B. And now, I, and now let me make the following statements, which those of you who've seen these strong subadditivity paradoxes are familiar with. Let me also define some white, red region, C. Okay, so, so the inside region is C, the region here is B, and the region outside is R. Now, you know, B and C are close by, okay? So you can think of states, and in fact, it's certainly true that B and C are entangled because they're just close by, and things which are close by in quantum field theory are entangled. So you'd say B, that would give you some, say, C is smaller than SC, okay? You could certainly arrange states which had, which had this kind of property. On the other hand, you know, it's true that, that the region R knows everything about the bulk, as we discussed, so it, in particular, it also knows about what's happening in C and what's happening in B. So this region R is also entangled with B. That would lead you to some claim that would say S A B, okay, because or S R B is smaller than S R because this region R is entangled with B. Okay? So if the region R is entangled with B, then the entanglement of these two is smaller, you know, R taken by itself is somehow more thermal than this. So now you would say, oh, look, is entangled with C and B is also entangled with R, and that would bring you in violation with a strong subadditivity of entropy, which would say that this has to be greater than or equal to SR plus S, uh, what did I do? Uh, SBC plus SRB, uh, yeah, SR plus SC, right. But, uh, but you see that, you know, these two inequalities are clearly in contradiction with this. And so you would have thought even in empty ADS with no black holes, you would have thought you have a paradox because this region in the middle B is entangled with C just by virtue of being close to C. And it's also entangled with R just because R has information about everything. Okay? So you would have thought that violates the monogamy of entanglement. But you see that you know, there's no paradox if you think carefully about how you define the entanglement entropy. In particular, this statement is true if you think only in terms of coarse entropies. 
the fact that D and C are, are entangled because they're close by. Okay? This is a statement that would hold, that should be true even if you think only in terms of coarse entropies. But this statement, the fact that B is also entangled with R, or that this C is also entangled with R, is a statement which requires you to consider very complicated operators in R. So this statement is only a statement that holds if you define these entropies as fine-grained entropies. If you define these entropies as fine-grained entropies, then you don't have a direct product, then there's no sense in which strong subadditivity holds for these regions R, B, and C. Because you don't have any direct product of the Hilbert, a direct product splitting of the Hilbert spaces, if you define things in terms of these fine-grained entropies. Okay, so fine-grained entropies don't coincide with your notion of bulk locality. Is this, is this clear? This, it's a, you know, you can, so either you can, so you can either assume bulk locality, but then all the statements you make should be within the context of this cold grain entropy, or you can not assume bulk locality, assume only boundary locality, and then you have, you're free to use the fine grain entropy. But if you try and mix these notions, uh, you would run into trouble with, with, with various identities, uh, and, and that's, that's an example of how these strong subadditivity paradoxes can emerge also in MTADS. Okay, I'm really sorry for going over time, not having time to explain this more, but I'm happy to explain this more in discussion afterwards. Is the real question left? Uh, no, how, how does AI arise? AI is, is, is a constraint I'm going to impose on what I want to call simple operators. That's so right. it's so a little definition theory, dependent. You would want it to be kind of dynamically arise, right? I mean, so huh. that's the, otherwise, otherwise if, you, if you have a choice of AI, I think with this, Good. you have established bulk locality. Good, so, 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 so the choice of AI would arise dynamically by saying that somehow, by asking the question, a physical question of what are the simple operators to measure? Yeah. So the, uh, so uh, yeah, exactly. these conjectures I made were, were by assuming that the simple operators to measure are field operators and products of field operators. So, uh, Okay, so you're right, but one might want to uh, ask uh, more carefully if that's true.